Oh, greeting viewers. It's great, it's great to have you join us today for our fourth book talk since we launched this series in November 2020. Thank you for joining us again and again. And for the first time viewers, we promise you that you will not regret spending this time with us. It will be both intriguing and eye-opening. Today we discuss The House of Stone with author Dr. Novuyo Rosa Nsuma. This webinar will be recorded and can be accessed on our YouTube page as well as on our website under videos in the coming week. As we proceed, you're welcome to submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. The moderator will address your questions at the, at the end of our session today. Do you like what we do? Does our content benefit your your pro you professionally or personal life? Then kindly like and follow us on social media. Take a minute to like our videos on our YouTube page so that we can reach as many people as possible. On Twitter, the hashtag for this series is hash Nairobi, um, has CGC Nairobi African Book Talk Series. Hashtag CGC Nairobi African Book Talk Series. We appreciate each and every one of you. I would now like to hand over to my colleague Lillian to welcome the moderator. Welcome Lillian. Thank you, Pauline for the great work that you've been doing, taking us through this series of book talk sessions. And obviously with great uh, leadership from Dr. Murugi and uh, support from the rest of the team. My work will be very simple. I will introduce CGC Nairobi and our able moderator, Dr. Mushai Mangola. Uh, CGC Nairobi was established in 2011 as part of Columbia's uh, university's global network of centers. And our aim is to create opportunities in research, scholarship, and teaching around the world. Uh, our center serves as a regional hub for research and collaboration as part of Columbia's university's strategy to achieve a global presence and link the continent to Columbia's scientific rigor, as well as the technological innovation aspect and academic leadership. It's a member of uh, Columbia Global Center Networks, uh, amongst other eight operating in Amman, Beijing, Mumbai, Paris, Istanbul, and Santiago. And our programs at CGC Nairobi um, are under three components, education, research, and public engagement. We focus on five uh, major projects, business empowerment, creative and liberal arts where this um, work uh, falls under, education and knowledge, health initiatives, refugees and migration. And without further ado, I'll quickly move to the next agenda. And that is to introduce our able um, moderator, Dr. Mushai Mangola. Dr. Mushai is a performance scholar who uses the lens of culture in our work as an academic as well as an artist and an activist. Um, she holds a doctorate in performance studies from Northwestern University, USA, as well as a master's cre in creative arts from the University of Melbourne and a bachelor of education from Kenyatta University. Uh, she also chairs the board of Raya Trust and uh, she's also an executive committee member of Codestria. She has done some work on um, um, intellectual collectives in under the elephant and Oricha collective. Currently, she co-facilitates the monthly Point Zero book, book cafe, which um, features public performance and conversations around literature. I therefore take this um, a great opportunity and pleasure to invite um, Dr. Mushai. Dr. Mushai kindly take over from here. Welcome, Dr. Tari. Thank you very, very much, Lillian. It's such a pleasure to once again have the privilege of hold, holding this space for this conversation. And today I could not be more thrilled to have as my guest the just 
absolutely amazing person who is um, the author for today. We'll be looking at her book, House of Stone, later on. But she currently is an assistant professor of fiction, writing, literature, and um, is on, is, is uh, an, an, a, 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 she's an assistant professor of fiction, writing, literature, and publishing at Emerson University. And you're going to find out so much about her. Um, Dr. Novuyo Chuma, welcome very, very much to this webinar series. Such a pleasure, I'm shy. I am so tempted to just go straight into the conversation and find out what you've been doing since we last had you over in Nairobi. But perhaps why don't we start with just a little bit of a taste of your book, and then we'll come back and just have some conversation about your journey as a writer. Um, I, have, I have thoroughly enjoyed traveling that journey in the last few weeks as I began to look at what your inspirations were, what else you have written. I know House of Stone is your debut novel, but there is so much more else there. And then we will come back to House of Stone. And I look forward to getting any questions um, that will come up in the webinar and putting them to you. But to start us off, I'm going to do just the first, very first words that welcome us into House of Stone. Prologue. I am a man on a mission, a vocation, call it, to remake the past and a wish to fashion all that has been into being and becoming. It all started when my surrogate father, Abednego Mlambo, sought me out in my lodgings two days ago with a bottle of bells in one hand and two crystal glasses pressed to his chest. He was dressed in a pair of his faded beige, don't touch my ankles, trousers that gave him the look of a civil servant complete with a matching shirt. He held the crystal glasses in place with his chin one balanced atop the other, the bottom glass clasped between the thumb and forefinger of the hand clutching the bells, the top glass muzzling his mouth so that his voice reached me as though a daydream, as he said, raising his free hand and slapping my back, that he appreciated how I had taken his son, Bukosi, under my wing, playing big brother, and that I was like a son to him. And he would, from then on, call me his surrogate son. It would have been perfect and may have even made me cry for no man had ever claimed me as his son had Abednego not beaten me to it. His sagging yellow face suddenly mugged by sadness as he began to shed tears for that Bukosi like he has been doing ever since the boy went missing. <laughs> if only he knew how the boy once made the eerie confession that he wished it was I who was his father, not he, Abednego. Never mind that I'm only 24 and because he had just turned 17. He's been missing for over a week since the beginning of October. Yes, I must say it again to believe it. It's already beginning to feel to me as though the boy never existed at all. Bukosi is missing. Bukosi is missing. Bukosi is missing. And for the rest of the book, Ravuya, you're going to take us on a journey, trying to figure out what happened to Bukosi. What an amazing beginning. I, I was just thinking about how this, how this story, how you begin this story. And I'm a storyteller. And one of the things that really struck me about the way you begin this story is that we literally start with a storyteller telling us a story that another storyteller is going to tell them. And then halfway through the book, we get a third storyteller. So there are all these storytellers telling stories and it is such a delicious premise um, for a book. And I 
I just wanted to say, it just wanted to say to you at the very beginning, what, what, what took you to this? What, what, what brought us into this wonderful world of storytelling that then takes us into this amazing journey? Oh, first of all, thank you so much. As you were reading the book, actually, so it come to life. You're such a wonderful um, orator, I'm shy. Um, such a pleasure. Um, I wish they'd made you the reader for the audiobook version of this book. <laughs> I wouldn't get the accent right. <laughs> um, the reader does not get the accent right either. It's an American reader. It's really horrible. Oh. Um, so, so this notion of storytellers, it actually came because in order to try and access this history, I had to interview family members. I had conversations, difficult conversations with my own mother, with my uncles. Um, and then because this history, um, a lot of this history is not our mainstream history. It's not in our history books. It's not talked about. That was the way to access those histories. So that's literally how I started this book by asking others to share their stories with me. And that informed then how I wrote it. Um, and that for me was also to say, this is also a valid way of, of telling our histories, right? These stories um, outside of these formal notions of what history is. Mm. And, and, and okay, so it's one thing that really strikes me is that in a way, this book collects a lot of the work that you've been doing. And I'm really glad that you emphasize this, that this is, this is something that comes from your life. It is stories that people tell. And in the end, it is a book about the stories that we tell each other that may or may not be in the official history. And even when it's in the official history, we bring our own perspectives and, and, um, Sometimes, you know, there are people who get ignored, they get erased, and you bring them to the, to the forefront. And this isn't just something you do in this book. This is something that I find you do again and again in all of your work. So why don't we just talk a little bit about your journey? I know that uh, you started out uh, <laughs> not as a writer, but studying economics and finance at, at, at WITS. And one of the things that really, really struck me, and I, I was very interested to find this out, was that you were sitting in the same class with Panache Chimugatmadi. And I would love to know what was going on in that class, because we'll talk a little bit about this later. But you guys seem to have been having some really interesting conversations, because you end up with your books uh, being in conversation. But then you went on and you did a master's in creative writing at Iowa. And this is where this book comes from. And then later on, you did your PhD in literature and creative writing. This journey from studying economics and finance and then to literature and creative writing, like what happened? <laughs> oh, I see you've really been in, in, in my archives, Shai. Pan yes, Panash and I were in the same economics class and neither of us knew that the other yearned to, to be a writer. Um, and we bumped into each other and we became friends. Um, and then my book Shadows came out. And then it's, it's only later that I discovered, oh, she was also passionate about literature. And just as, as it's been so interesting that in, in sickness, so this, this interest in history um, from these different angles, because again, we had not discussed our projects when House of Stone came out and these bones will rise again. And then it was delightful to connect after so many years and discover that these books, these works are in conversation. Um, it's a really, really lovely intellectual work. So yes, economics. I, I actually started with um, architecture in Zimbabwe for one semester, aka architecture. I, I, so I, I was trying to, I've been trying to escape into writing for a long time. Um, and then I, I left that and because I wanted to write. And of course I'm in Zimbabwe, you know, that, that didn't make sense. So I started again and I studied economics. And this time I finished the degree. Um, but at that, that time, I knew, again, that uh, really writing was my passion. And um, there are many authors and writers who helped me along the way. Um, chiefly among them, Novai Bulawai. We were just talking online. We'd never met. And then she's the one who encouraged me to try and apply for writing programs in the USA. Um, so I kept bothering her. That, you know, I want to write. And it's so and I don't know how to do it. And I'm stuck. I'm in the wrong career path. So that was the journey. I applied for creative writing programs and I was fortunate enough to, to get into the Iowa Writers Workshop. And then from then on, I followed this writing journey. Um, so it's, it's been you know, incremental. And at the time when I moved to Iowa City in 2013, I had a draft of House of Stone, a rough draft of the book. And so it was the project that I, I was working on it and really, really wanted um, to focus on and to have in the world. 
And, and, and one of the things, I know it sounds like you took a very long time writing the book because um, you did a lot of short um, story fiction and then you took the time out and really worked on this, on this novel that took very long. But one of the things that, um, as I look at your work, I, I cannot help but think about the attention you pay to the craft of writing. You're very, very particular. Because I, I perform literature and one of the things I love to do is to read aloud the books I'm reading. And some read some books, you know, you read it and then, you know, it's like, okay, very quickly you go back to reading it inside your head. But your book is a book that is such a delight in reading. Even when you're, you know, there's a part in the book where you talk about um, these part, these bones that are found and you name each bone, but it feels very poetic about the way that you do it. So that even as, I'm, as, as I was reading it, that was a part I had to stop and read aloud. And you really pay attention to language and craft. Having done a master's in creative writing, why the PhD? <laughs> For most people, because I mean, I'm an African and we take our education seriously. You don't yeah. play with us. Um, <laughs> so um, the master's really it was in, in creative writing, whereas the PhD was in literature and creative writing. So um, I was really interested in that juxtaposition, bringing literature, that um, intellectual rigor. So for instance, when I was writing House of Stone, I read Fanon, The Wretched of the Earth, but very much just not in any sort of intellectual sense, really to get that knowledge, to understand our history. It was a pleasure to return to Fanon in my PhD and bring that intellectual rigor. Um, so that post-colonial foundation, that history, um, I think for me has, it's, it has helped me to also think about writing or art and the world um, in terms of ideas and, and, and abstract notions of being. Right, which I think is also useful in trying to understand systems and our histories and, and people. Um, so that was a real pleasure for me. And certainly I see the attention to the, you know, being in the archives in the work that um, yes, you're drawing from what you've heard and what you're told, but just like we'll find out um, the, the protagonist in, in House of Stone has, is very well read and he does everything from reading you know, just the fiction that perhaps one could buy off the streets to going into the archives and, you know, researching stuff. And I felt that was very much a reflection of what perhaps you as a narrator um, as well are. And so the last time when I was rereading the book, I couldn't help thinking, okay, there's this fourth narrator who is also over there, who's putting it all together for us. And I really enjoyed that. Um, you first came to the attention of, um, I guess, the greater reading public through your short stories, having won um, what is now the Yvonne Vera Award um, for your first story, which was You in Paradise. I believe you were then, and maybe still are, the youngest winner of that particular prize. Is that true? That is true. Yes, I was 21. Okay, and I must say that when I read that, I thought, oh, okay, she was very young, so it must have been a nice, fluffy story. And then I went and I read it and I thought, wow, this is such a mature story. And then you've been published. People can find you in several anthologies, the Bed Book of Short Stories, A Life in Full and Other Short Stories, Where to Now, Short Stories from Zimbabwe. And most recently, at least as far as I have found, you've, you're, 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 you're in an anthology on refugee writers, um, which is called The Displaced, um, that's edited by the Pulitzer Prize winning author, Viet Tan Nguyen. And I find that this particular collection really interested me because it seems to me that throughout all your writing, you seem to be interested in this identity of people who live in exile or as refugees or in diaspora, who for some reason or the other are not in the place where they grew up. And you'll see a little bit of this in House of Stone. What draws you to this identity of people who are displaced from their home, at least their original home? Oh, uh, such a, a wonderful question. I'm actually teaching a, a class on immigrant and refugee writing um, this year here in the USA. Um, you know, so, so when you mentioned that, that essay in Viet Tang Vien's um, anthology, it's, it's one of the most, I think, personal things I've written. I was for a brief time undocumented in South Africa, brief time, and it's something I never talk about. Because um, again, one, one feels responsibility um, or shame. Um, and so 
I guess the, the sense of being displaced is something one as it's so interesting. Growing up in Zimbabwe as a Ndebele, we are the we are we are we are a minority in Zimbabwe. Um, so the, the Shona ethnicity makes up about 80, 80 something percent, we're about 18 percent, then the remaining two percent percent are the other minorities. Um, and it's really complicated because other minorities in Zimbabwe feel that the Ndebele also over overshadow them. Uh, but because of Zimbabwe's very fraught history, the Kukura Hundi, as the Ndebele, just growing up in Matele land, there was always the sense that one does not belong in Zimbabwe. So really a detached and disinterest and a feeling left out of the country. So that, and that's something you grew up with, you don't think about, but that became very, very stark and, and uh, important to me when we moved to South Africa. And then we became real, real exiles, real, re really displaced people, Zimbabweans. You know, which, which was the worst uh, insult one could pay in South Africa because people start projecting what they see on TV on you. Um, it was such that for a long time I, I, I hid, I, I, I can pass for, for being South African because the Ndevele and the Zulu were related, Shaga Zulu. Mzeliga um, broke away from Shaga Zulu and moved into what's now Zimbabwe. So for a long time I lashed onto that. Unless um, someone asked, I would never tell them that I was from Zimbabwe. Um, and so that was a real sense of displacement. And I found myself yearning for home. But then which home? Because I'd never felt at home at home. So, so even the sense of home became the sort of utopic or mythic sense. And that has, I think, subconsciously driven my writing. And you capture a lot of that in that you in paradise, because again, this is this young woman. And one of the things that really struck me was when, um, you know, what you said about so many of us who, we may hold the citizenship of one country, but if you belong to the border communities, you could very much easily go to the next country or, you know, and often you could pass. And part of her, what she's struggling with, you know, she's being told, say that you belong, you know, you know, you are, you are from South Africa, you know, you're from KwaZulu-Natal and she's, you know, you're still, I guess it's, it's difficult because you know, it's a lie, but then in a way we are also the same people. I, I just find that really interesting. And I should mention that you are an editor of Bear Life Review, which publishes immigrant and refugee writers. And I think th that connection that you draw that to be an exile, to be a refugee, even if it's an economic refugee, to be a new immigrant is automatically to be a minority and a minority whose stories often don't matter in terms of the larger narrative of the nation where you are. And so even for people who are there legally and have the papers, it's always this uncomfortable um, place to be. You were published in uh, 2014, um, the first, with your first uh, collection. I hope there will be many more. It is an anthology of stories that was called Shadows. I was mentioning to you, I feel that you in paradise is somewhat a foreshadowing of the title novella. And this really brought you again back to attention because it won the 2014 Herman Charles Bosman Prize. It was long listed for the 2014 Etisalet Prize for Literature. We have seen you coming for a long time with all these prizes. Could you tell us just a little bit about Shadows? What, what, what was at least that title novella about? Oh, Shadows, yo. Okay, Shadows was about, um, it's about Zimbabwean migrants, Zimbabweans living in Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans living in South Africa. It really it was, it was, it came in a rush and, and I remember I wrote it in a, in a rush, the first draft, because it just came. And it's about, again, what you'd call displaced people and not even just in the geographical sense, even displaced within one's community. A poor an artist um, was trying to make a living in Zimbabwe amid the chaos. Um, and then his girlfriend, Nomsa flees to, um, Egoli, City of Gold, Johannesburg, and he follows her. Um, and it's about those dreams. Um, and then there's an eerie section there where, where Poi is being interviewed by a CIO officer. Um, and it, it, it's eerie because a few years after the Shadows was written, I, I, I saw a, a news report about a similar sort of incident. That was things uh, that was happening in Zimbabwe, but then these are things we also grew up hearing about in Zimbabwe. You know that if you get taken by the CIO, this is what happens. CIO would be the uh, Central Intelligence. It's our uh, office, like CIA, like the USA CIA. That sort of. And they would, you know, they're known for grabbing people. Why you're like? I know what you're talking about. <laughs> would call it CID. Okay. Oh wow. And then this is um, 
I think one of the things that you just do so well is to capture what that sense is. I'm also interested in, and I, I wish I could talk a little bit more about this, but just very quickly, you've done a lot of nonfiction. A lot of it is about Zimbabwe. Um, but then you've also done, and I really was interested about how you write about writing, how you, you, you really are somebody who's genuinely interested in other writers' work. Sometimes, you know, you read a writer and yes, I can tell they read, but it, it doesn't seem to, they don't seem to be as much in conversation with writers in their work as you seem to be. And you do a lot of that in fiction. I absolutely love the way you can, you can encapsulate in a few lines your thoughts about a book. So, you know, a lot of people will do summaries, but what I enjoy about reading and any, if anybody just Googles, you know, your, your best of 2020 or just looking at how you write about other writers or talk about other writers. Um, you have a way of getting to, this is what I love about their writing. And then when I look at that, I see echoes of that in your book. One of the things, and I'm, I'll start before, you know, we'll go a little bit to House of Stone and then I'll come back. I saw that House of Stone won the 2019 Edward Stanford Travel Writing Award. I thought, how is House of Stone travel writing? That one really blew me away. So I went to look for that. And your acceptance speech when you talked about, um, and you can tell us why you won it. But one of the things I absolutely loved in your acceptance speech, you were so generous with talking about, here are all these other writers who I want to give shout outs to. And this is what I love about their writing that I just, I fell in love with you all over again on the spot. But just tell me, how did you win a travel writing award for House of Stone? What was this for? I have to ask the judges. <laughs> really what they, according to them, it was the sense of place, I guess, that the reader, when they end the book, they will travel to these places and that there's a specificity. In the, in, and so, um, whether it's in uh, the Balagwe concentration camp or Zimbabwe in 1984, the city of Bulawayo. So that was an interesting sort of idea about what travel writing or what traveling is in, in, in a work of fiction or in, in, in writing. Yeah. <laughs> I was as surprised as you. I was like, really? Okay. You know, I was thinking about this. Um, Nanjala Nyabola has got a book where she talks about traveling while black. And she talks about this thing of as an African going to another African uh, somewhere else in Africa. And okay, she's talking about it of how often do we visit, but also about the fact that we often don't see the world through our own eyes for ourselves. So a lot of travel writing about Africa is for others. It's for the outside looking in. And, and when I saw that you got it for a place, you know, for being able to capture the essence of the place, this last time when I was reading the book, I really read it for that sense of place. And some of my favorite passages, for example, there's a place where this young man is shadowing this woman whom he just falls in. It was literally love at first sight. He sees her and he's following her. And many writers would just say, you know, he followed her from this place to that place. But you literally take us on a walk with him um, over that place. And for me, that was one of the most beautiful passages in the book. And so, yes, I absolutely understand why they gave you that award. And perhaps now I'm already beginning to talk about House of Stone. Why don't you give me a reading from House of Stone? Fantastic. Thank you, Mashai. Mosha. I'm going to read just for two minutes, two to three two to three minutes. Um, and so I'm going to read from the chapter titled The Prayer Meeting. So this is the UK version of the book, the paperback. Um, and he, at this point, so when, when Mishai started reading, Zamani has decided that he's the Mlambo surrogate's son and Bukosi is missing. Here, at the, when we get to the prayer meeting, Bukosi is still missing and Zamani is trying to inch himself into the family. Right. He's feeling very possessive of Mama Agnes. Um, so I'm going to start reading. I heard Mama Agnes when I crept in to use the loo, telling my surrogate father, Abednego, that the Reverend Pastor Reuben is coming this evening to pray for Bukosi and that the ladies of the church will be accompanying him. My surrogate father wanted to know why they had to come here. And my surrogate mother replied, I imagine pointing to her face because um, Abednego beat up Mama Agnes, that as she can't go to the Reverend Pastor at the moment, the Reverend Pastor is coming to her. This shut him up. 
At the appointed hour, with the knock on the door and a procession of neighbors, we gather in the Mlambo living room. Myself, Mama Agnes, the Reverend Pastor, the ladies of the church, and all of the Mlambo's neighbors and friends who have come to pray for Wukosi. My surrogate father, as to be expected, has slinked off on his lonely late night searches. Doesn't Mama Agnes wonder where he goes to? Does she know? I doubt it. She's probably just relieved that he is out of the house. I look around at the congregation and marvel at how everyone has pulled together in a mass effort to find Mukosi. He is loved. I wonder if there's anyone who would care today if I went missing. I can't see Mama Agnes and I suddenly feel panicked, but then I spot her turned away from me, away from the frisky bulb lights and hovering instead in the murkiest of shadows, right by the Reverend Pastor's crotch. For she's on her knees, her pillowy frame gathered in ruffled becomingness, in a floral green velvet colored dress, which matches the duke on her head. Her divine countenance bob bobs next to the Reverend Pastor's trousers, which, because canali suits are made to measure, bulges rather obscenely in the shape of a banana lying flat against his right thigh. He keeps bringing her face dangerously close to his banana, rattling Saturn out of her head with his huge paw and shouting, can I get a hallelujah? The neighbors give him a hallelujah. Can I get an amen? How many more? He's a famous man, that Reverend Pastor, scandalously famous. For the past months, he's been making the front news of the independent papers, which has been happening more frequently what with the presidential elections next year. He's been writing sermonic articles in which he pleads with the current government to step down, to leave the job of running a country to better suited scoundrels, even praying in one article for God to intervene, to send a flood, to send a plague, to send the UN troops, to send America to invade us like they did Iraq and Afghanistan, to show who is God. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you for that. And one of the wonderful things about that passage is it brings in the humor that runs through the entire book. And I think that you do that so well, because let's be honest, House of Stone is not an easy read all through in the sense that you take us through some really, really um, deeply disturbing events. And you, you do not want to, you don't gloss over them. You, you take your time in in taking us through, this is what happened. And you need to know that it happened like this. But then what keeps one going is that, especially the, the, the protagonist who is Amani, who's, whose voice we are hearing, he will be observing a scene and he's got, he's got such a wicked sense of humor that you can't help laughing, even as you, know, you go through a really gruesome experience and then you know, something happens or there's a turn of phrase and you just, you just shake your head and start laughing. And, and I think that passage captures that so well. Thank you for that. Um, House of Stone. Why, why House of Stone? What, what's the title about? House of Stone, the country name Zimbabwe. Um, yeah. And it, it was, it's very interesting, this idea of refugee dormant being in exile. It, it really, for me, was a desire to, to learn our history, but also then to tell those histories that are not part of the mainstream history. Um, because Zimbabwe has, you know, we have our, our liberation movements are very, very um, suspicious of, of, of history. And they, history is something that's contro controlled, tightly controlled in a space like Zimbabwe. So I grew up in a space where people, interesting with Zimbabweans, we didn't really talk about our past. Um, you'd have lovely stories about, you know, my grandfather tells you growing up, as, you know, in, in the in the Bundu, in the rural areas, my mother stays in school, very lovely, happy memories, but we never actually spoke about the difficult things. Um, and they manifest maybe as prejudice, you know, I grew up with my uncles despising the Shona, for instance, you know, that sort of ethnic, and, and it's something I never understood until I started asking them about Kukura Hundi. Um, so the, the title was a direct sort of, um, jab or um, reference to Zimbabwe to say this is a history of Zimbabwe. It's part of that. And history also in terms of stories, right? So, so that was also important, history as stories, the stories we tell ourselves. Um, so this is a book maybe that simulates conversations that we, that I did not hear um, growing up about things that were maybe too difficult to talk about. 
And what I think is a really brilliant, I mean, House of Stone, those who know that the name Zimbabwe, that's literally what that refers to. Uh, but that you also, it is also about a literal house of stone. Um, this is taking place in a house and there is um, the protagonist who starts out by living in the little room out at the back, which is rented. And the entire book is about him wanting to come in. And yet, you know, and then there's Bukosi, whom we met right at the beginning, who is a son, a proper son. He's not the surrogate son, he's a proper son. He has a room in the house. He's welcomed in the house. And through it all, Bukosi is, is struggling with the history of the family. So you're both talking about the history of Zimbabwe and, and people, you know, younger people in particular, you know, wanting to know the history of the country, which is what we, we find out this younger, the younger generation doing, but you're also talking about this literal house. I just found that as a metaphor to be so, so powerful. And yes, thank you for that. And that I think is something you do very well in the book. There are all these metaphors that you put in and you allude to, um, there's a particular brilliant passage, I think, where a sermon is going on, and as the sermon is going on, it's taking you further um, into what is happening in the person's story. And the way you weave those together is just absolutely beautiful. Um, I want to talk about history and story, but you mentioned this word, Bukurahundi. It's in the middle of the book. You can't get away from it, even though the whole book is not about this. It's, it's right at the center of the book. What is it? What does it signify? And why is it so important? Yo, Kukurawundi. Uh, Kukurawundi, so it's, it's a short term, the, the chaff that washes away the, uh, it's the early rains that washes away the chaff before the spring rains, right? Um, so it's, 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 I think it's just important to just give that brief etymology. The word used to sig sig signify joy, harvest, right? Very pleasurable, positive term in, in the Shona language until the early 80s where it was used to talk about a government sponsored with the help of North Korea operation um, to, uh, according to the government, weed out dissidents in Matemele land. Um, and in the process, um, the t it's, it's like 20,000, the, the current number is 20,000, um, but the, the debate about that 20,000 civilians were massacred. Um, and so for me, it's in trying to deal with this, this, this word, I wasn't interested in the facts because the facts, we keep debating and arguing about the facts. The Muslims are good at that, but no one is actually talking about the experience. So I was very interested for me in the experience of it, um, especially because, and what that, and where that came from was talking to my own family, my own mother. She was happy to tell me about the liberation war history then when I asked about the Kukura Hundi, I saw her tense, she froze. She would not talk about it at first. She actually did not talk about it until the book was published. That's when I realized there's something there, there's a wound. And that's, that's sort of, and for the first time I was seeing my mother as, as a person apart from my mother and realizing she had lived many lives before me. Um, and that's how that became the center of the book. This wound that, you know, is still fresh and we keep going around. Um, and so for me, whether it's 20,000 to 2,000, I decided you know, ex the experience of it is what I was sort of interested in trying to get at. So that's how money tries to understand. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's so important is that it's not just about you know, the events because we can all argue about events, but at the end of the day, you're saying these events happened to real people. And this is what happened to them. These are the consequences of, of, of what happened to them. And, and it's hard for you to look away, you know, when you, it's one thing when you say so many people died. It's another thing when we look at a person and a family and somebody says, this happened to my brother or to my wife or to my child. And this was the effect. And you see how these people live with the effects of this history. Um, the word that kept coming to my mind when you were, you were when I was reading it um, was this idea of trauma and how we often gloss over, you know, as long as I survive, it's like, you know, be happy you survived. And in Kenya, we have the phrase accept and move on and let's just move on and create a better future. And what I think you bring to life is that people live with these histories. And even when, you know, as you said, children may not know what their parents went through, 
but it comes through in the way their parents interact with them in terms of the silences. And one of the really poignant parts is that this young man, Bukosi, is when he, he wants to know and his parents just can't bring themselves to tell this story. I think that's just so really powerful. I think the other thing that you do really well is to bring um, to life the fact that we have many different stories and very many different histories, even when we share one country. Um, I think it's Stuart Hill, um, Stuart Hall talks about the narrative of a nation. And then he says, you know, what, <laughs> first of all, you all have to embrace the official narrative. And in your book, there's so much rebellion against that. But secondly, it is the official narrative of the people. They are people who are centered as these are the people who matter. And your question is what happens to everybody else in this, yes. in this narrative? And I find that really, really powerful. Wow, so so beautifully put, Mshai. Because um, in Zimbabwe, the thing, I don't know if Kenya suffers from the same thing. If you do not fight in the liberation war, you are a nobody, literally. That's, that's how, you know, those who sacrifice for the country matter, the rest of us, it's not, it's not your country, basically. Mm, mm, mm. I, I just want to bring in, uh, somebody's asking, Shirley uh, Chikukwa is ask, says, in shaping the scholarly side of you, you mentioned Fanon, and really being able to understand and capture not only Zimbabwean history, but a broader, I think, decolonized discourse. So this is the question, why fiction as the medium for communicating that history. Do you find that there's room in an academic sense to capture these experiences? And she's specifically speaking as a Zimbabwean who finds that fiction has been able to capture experience in a way that history has not been able to do. So she's asking in connection with that, do you think there is a way to translate this discourse of experience into an academic sense that can inform our understanding and reading of history? Especially because you talked about experience. How do we translate that into these histories? Because Zimbabwe has got many historians who've talked about Zimbabwe's history. Wow, well, that, that's a beautiful question. Yes. Um, thank you, Shirley. You know, as she was talking, I was, I was thinking some of my research for House of Stone was reading um, PhD theses, mostly South African universities. You know, you can find them online. Um, and these were done on trauma, on and specifically Kukura Hongi Matebele land, um, um, trauma, communities, how communities are trying to heal and what's happening in terms of trying to address Kukura Hongi at a communal level, talking to those who were there at the time or war veterans. And so it's interesting, there's actually, a, I think there's, there, there's some great academic work that's just not, for some reason it's not in the mainstream, it's not published or it's, it's, it's just there. Um, so, so that is to say that the ac academia or the intellectual rigor, right, um, that one can bring to these histories is definitely, it's needed, it's necessary, it's part of, of I think, building with a national or human sort of knowledge. It's just unfortunate that in a place like Zimbabwe, knowledge is not respected, and this is of course tied, and by knowledge not being respected, I mean at, at a structural level, right? I, I, I did not read, I had, did not have access to Zimbabwean authors until I got to, to the USA in Iowa City in the library, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so fiction, for me fiction, it was because I didn't have to worry about facts. I was interested in truth, a very different experiential. And if you think of how our oral histories have been disparaged and you know, it's not real history, where, where, where's your rigor? That for me allowed for a different type of knowing to come into play, right? And when mm -hmm. people share their lives, that is valid, that is story, that is sharing knowledge. Um, and then of course, fiction is, I think will reach a broader audience. Pe people are, are less intimidated, though some claim to be intimidated by House of Stone, people are less intimidated by fiction than if you give them an academic work. But there's definitely a conversation, right? Different types of writing overlap. Mm. Mm. Yeah. As I was thinking of Toni Morrison writes about how sometimes you can only get to the truth, I think she says, to, to, through fiction. Right, because the facts are there, but then it's a fine line when you say it's historical fiction. And in fact, I think one thing that's really interesting about your book is that some of these, um, in, in particular, I'm thinking of one character who looms very large in the book. And these are living, breathing people. Well, he's no longer living, but these are people who people know they can go, they can look them up. I mean, and you know, often like with a lot of historical fiction books, you know, you have the big names, like the president is mentioned somewhere in the background. But when you 
create a pic somebody whom people know and bring them to life in the novel. And then people are like, oh, but that didn't happen. And you know, it's this really fine line where it's believable enough for people who know that person or who know that history to be able to embrace that and to say, okay, we don't have to have stuck to, did you see, you know, can I check his diary for the day? Was he in this place at that time? And I just want to say that I found it really a tribute to the way you walk this fine line that you won the uh, Bulawayo Arts Award for Outstanding Fiction. Because I think if it didn't work in Bulawayo, <laughs> then, you know, they'd be like, ah, uh -uh, now my sister, let's try again. And I think you did that really well. Another fine line that I think you had to walk, and I want to read from Anand Madhani, who says, I'm curious about the choices you made around using humor. I know it leaves heavy, you know, of course you've got um, heavy content, so it leaves heavy content, it releases tension, but how did you handle not downgrading clearly painful topics as a result? Wow. Like, it feels like a really difficult line to walk. It's a, it's a beautiful question. Um, the first thing I will say is, is I, I, that strain of humor, it, it came from, and I think it, following just what I know about Kenya and Arab, I have my, it's, it's something that's there in, in a lot of our societies. It's just watching, just observing Zimbabwe's society or these societies where we, we laugh through a lot of our pain or trauma. It's also a way of just living. So Zimbabweans, it's, you know, we're happy people, you know, happy. You know, we, we joke through our pain. Um, so, so that for me was just also part of the lived experience. I think the humor, it wasn't even um, a, a concerted effort on my part. It's part of the fabric of the society I grew up in. And that was also part of trying, that, that was the struggle in trying to reconcile Kukura. When you say, when I say, when I say watching my mother, watching my mother, she, she's normal to me. And, and, and that's, that was another understanding I brought to something like genocide or trauma. We always think of victims in the very most extreme sense, right? That someone cannot be a whole person. And so that for me was also uh, a way to try and, and, and fuse the multiple selves that I've experienced in Zimbabwe, that one can be a person who laughs and um, is joyous and also have gone through the deepest and darkest sort of periods in one's life. It's one is not antithetical to the other. Um, it was also important for me not to have my characters also, which is a very Western, you know, sort of thing, to be defined by that one trauma, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that yeah. In, in all your 50 years, this, this one thing has happened and it encapsulates everything that you are. Because I don't think that's true. That's, tr that's true of the human experience in its, in its breadth, right? Um, and so that was that was sort of the thing. I don't think I would have been able to bear also as an author to write such a book if there was no levity or humor or even joy. It would have been very depressing um, and then very not true to the spirit of, of Zimbabwe or the people, or people in general. Yeah. One of my favorite can characters, and I think for everybody, there's a, there's a character called Tandi who all sorts of things happen to. But one of the things I love about her is she goes through a lot, including having to be in a refugee camp for several years during um, as the liberation war is going on. And you would think when you next see her, she'll be completely beaten by down by this experience. Her dreams that she once had have all died. And she, she emerges as a really strong woman. And then, you know, she goes off into a, a, a place, I won't give this away, but a place where she'd been before and had been very depressed. And, you know, she's there and she's pulled herself together and she's doing amazing, wonderful things. And I think that's true, of, you know, it's that thing of you say one experience doesn't define us, it shapes us, it influences us, but we also, and this is not to say that it's one, you know, it's, a, it's great when bad things happen, but that that's not all that people's lives shrink down into. They're able to do and keep doing other things as well. I want to, I, I want to make sure that I say this and do this, but one of the things I told you this I loved about the book is that you tell, so there's book one and book two, and then there are the bookends. And one of the things I absolutely love is that a lot of these stories that have to do with war, that have to, especially liberation wars, um, genocide. Um, and you know, right at the beginning when you start, I was a little bit afraid because it seems to be such a male story. And then right in the middle of the book, literally you shift to book two. I remember when I first read it and I, I said this to you, I said, wow, that's amazing. It's literal. And the first lines that are said there is what kind of family history would it be anyway 
that chronicles the surrogate father without also ushering forth the voice of the surrogate mother. And one thing you beautifully do is throughout, show us why both of these are important. And, and this is why I brought in Panache earlier on, is that I read your book and then I read Panache and I was like, oh my God, it's like these two were sitting and talking to each other and then reflecting. And I don't want to talk about what Panache was doing, but why for you was it so important that book one, right, was not, was just, that wasn't enough. That wasn't mm -hmm. enough to tell us there's the official history and then this is a personal history. Why did we need book two? Oh, a beautiful question. Um, if, I think if you know, um, Abed Nego's history is, is very, um, and it's entwined in very um, direct ways with the, with the national history. And, mm -hmm. and so in Zimbabwe, we're very patriarchal, the big man syndrome, right? National history, fathers and sons were, were very much interested in, in the male. And then uh, Mama Agnes's stories, um, for me, they, they, they feel, I don't wanna say nuanced, it's, it's, it's because she's also a woman who has, has had her own dreams, but they're different type of relationship with the nation, not so much interested in the nation in that very aggressive way, right? But very interested also in the self and in community. Um, and so for me, it would, it would not have been a complete story if, if, if there was only just that one sort of patriarchal national narrative, um, especially thinking of the many women, if, if you read our history, so many women um, contributed in various ways to the liberation struggle and to liberation, and 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 they are not recognized. So their contributions are not, and this doesn't even have to be even in sort of very valiant way. The women who stayed behind, who cooked, you know, who who looked after the sons um, who had gone away, um, who who kept the, the nation together, who forfeited their own dreams, right? mm -hmm. and and so that for me was also as important. Um, yeah. And indeed, when we start the story and you heard the first two minutes of it, it's very much a male story. And even if you keep reading a bit longer, Mama Agnes is in the background. So, so basically in this house of stone, I said, you know, you have Zamani, who is the protagonist, who's the guy who comes in. And then there are two families and you meet the father and the mother. And the mother seems to be in the background doing what women do, support their men. But the book two is actually when the son goes or the surrogate son or the son was trying to become a surrogate son having heard his father's story then goes and finds out what, what what's what's the story of the mother and i love that at the end it's both father and mother together that he's standing there and then you as a narrator i said okay but then the narrator was male and then in the book that i have you come and do your acknowledgments at the end and i felt it was you as a female narrator say, yes, you heard the male narrator, but don't forget, I'm really, I'm really the one who is behind. <laughs> I also love that when you do the history, I had never heard of the queen, oh. you know, the Ndebele queen. And mm -hmm. you want to say a little bit more about that? I just thought that was so powerful because when we hear the stories of our own, um, the, the nations that were there before colonialism, again, it's very often through the stories of the men and I was like, what, wait, there was a, a queen and the king had to flee and what? And I actually went and looked her up. I thought you'd made her up. I know you hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> that was, see, that was why for me, discovering our history was such a pleasure. You, you get these, it's, 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 it comes alive. It's so interesting. So Queen Lozike, uh, the Ndebele, they call her the Ndebele King, right? Ndebele, because she was very powerful. She was King Lobengula's senior wife. And then in the 1890s, um, when Cecil, jo when the, the the Rhodes and his company came and they were trying to take over Matevile land, King Lobengula had to flee, uh, and and the whole thing was that the, the king would flee, then would return after a while, um, and Lobengula never returned. So in his absence, Queen Lozike stepped in, and she was a formidable queen. She'd go and meet Rhodes, she'd negotiate. On, on behalf of her people, she, she, you know, she, so she, so it, her, her story is so fascinating, and it's a story that's not often told. It's something I did not know growing up in Zimbabwe. Whereas, imagine we know Mbuyani Handa, right? So that's where the politics of Zimbabwe is like. Mbuyani Handa is the, there's a national holiday to commemorate her. She's known as having led the first Chimurenga. That first Chimurenga is known as the Wolf, the Red Eggs in Debele, right? Say more. Right, we say Mbene Handa led the Shona ethnicity in that war, Queen Lozike led the Ndebeles, right? But in our history, we only 
acknowledge Mbiani Handa, right, in the national history. So those politics. So for me, it was a delight and also questions, why do we not learn about this at school? Mm -hmm. Why am I finding out about this in this way? Mm -hmm. It takes us back to the question of history that we were talking about. And so what do we do? And, and I don't think I'm, you know, the, the way you foreground that, yes, we have the majority and the majority may have a history, whether it is, um, you know, a gendered majority, an ethnic majority, a racial majority. And I think this is echoing right across the world, a political majority, but that the minority must also have a place and their stories must be told and their wounds are the wounds of the nation. And so I guess my question to you is, how do we bring these in? Um, what do we do with them? Because the wounds are so deep and, and you know, I, I, there's often this thing of, but if we go there, this is going to split our unity, uh, which is the fear even of people who say, don't, 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 don't let's just leave it alone. What do we do with this? Because your book left me with that question. Yes. Okay, so then now we know. What do we do with this? It's, it's, such, a hard question. <laughs> it's such a difficult question. Um, and I don't think there are easy answers in practice. So, so you know, so, so thinking of Zimbabwe, just this idea of the wounded minority. If you think to, to, to um, when Zimbabwe was still Rhodesia, right? And we gained our independence, we were the wounded, right? Majority, but we were the wounded black Africans. And, and so, and now I'm thinking just about pain and society and, and how we move. Those wounds became justification for a different kind of brutality in, in Zimbabwe, right? Where when the, you know, Mugabe and then took over and it's a really complicated history. There was Kukura Hundi. You have these new wounds and you see that in the novel with Dumo who, who's a firebrand revolutionary trying to lead the people of Matebele land to break away from Zimbabwe due to Kukura Hundi. And so, that sort of question is difficult because there's a way in which you can replicate, in which wounds can become weapons to replicate new forms of oppression, right? And I think in the end, there's that question where Zaman says he's no longer sure what Dumo is doing, right? What started as a cause, Dumo seems to be, you know, he seems to be trying to be the next Mugabe in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the sort of, uh, and that's why there are no easy answers here. It's, 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 there's, in Zimbabwe right now, there's just so much suspicion, right? When someone talks about Kukura Hundi, the question is, who, who are you? Is this a weapon? Is this, and, and it's, so it's, 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 large, it's symptomatic of just a larger social structure that, that we inherited from colonialism, right? But beyond that, beyond that, I think my, my one thing is center the victims. And in that sense, which is, which is why experience for me became more important, which is whether it's 20,000 or 2,000, Moving on and forgetting doesn't doesn't help. Center these experiences, right? These these people, honor them, which is giving them the help they need, space to tell their stories, to have their stories acknowledged. In Zimbabwe, that didn't happen, right? After when there was the unity accord, that very fear it will um, split the country. The victims did not get that unity. They, literally, they were told to pretend as though what they went through had not happened, right? So, you had people who were, you know they would have nightmares. They they could not function. And they could not say why, and there was no remedy. So that that is the, the real tragedy in that sense, right? Yeah, and I asked that question because I don't like asking writers to solve the problems of society. But <laughs> um, the book starts with this young man trying to get into the house and learning the stories of those who live in the house. But in his mind, he's also fitting in his story into their stories, and it ends with him inside the house but he hasn't yet shared his stories. And so for me, I was like, well, it, 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 it's challenging us. It isn't saying you're going to solve them, but hurt people, hurt others. And until you are able to heal all these wounds together, and that just begins, I think, by that sharing, by that welcoming. I, I said to you, and you know that um, in Kenya, in Swahili, actually not in Kenya, in Swahili, the, the name Zamani, which is the name of the protagonist, means the past. And so literally, Wow. by them bringing him into his house. They are living with the past in their present and they're going to go into their future with that past holding them, right? Until And so there's this really interesting metaphor that's doing amazing work for me that I just think 
there are just so many ways that I think your book works to get us to think about history. I haven't been able to get us, I don't have the time to talk about the way you talk about history as this big official narrative. But then there is the he hyphen story, which reminds us, I think, and you can correct me on this, that you also have the personal stories. You have the little stories within the larger stories. And then that these are stories. So also um, their perspectives, their people's understanding of where they're coming from. And I think for every one of us, whether we are Zimbabweans or wherever we are in the world, when we look at our own nations, this thing of the past living with us in the present and becoming part of our future and, and all that it carries with that is really so much a part of who we are. And I, I, I don't know what you think about all of that, but would you like to give me a comment um, I will ask if you wanted to do a last reading before I, I close, before we close. Thank you so much, Shai. I'm, I'm just going to add, as you were talking, I was nodding because if you notice the, the, the story, and stories are fascinating because they go in tangents. I noticed if you ask people even about the liberation walk around, they tell stories in the sense that you'd find out someone had fallen in love with someone and had run away from the war because to follow someone. So these very beautiful sort of elements or someone had dreamed to, to, you know, get an education. So they ran away from home to go to the city and then they got involved in, you know, a political group. So even the way those stories evolve, I think they show that that beauty of, of the human spirit, right? That, that as we are living, we are struggling in a positive sense too, you know, um, and it, it was, it's for me, it's, it's very important because national history also tends to, 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 to shape people into, you know, your group, your lump, your group. And what's interesting is what happened to you in the larger sense, not your own dream, but what you were trying to do with your life when this event happened, which is a very different relationship to a history and our past. Um, so that was also pleasurable in talking to people who learn fascinating things about their lives um, in the midst of war. Um, and that, oh, people just like us in Zimbabwe now during, you know, our food shortages, people had dreams, you know, you're not just waiting passively to die. Um, yeah. Mm. And no matter where you look, I mean, I was thinking about this, you know, you listen to the news, whether we're looking at Myanmar or we're looking at the US or we're looking at Uganda or indeed anywhere in the world, the issues that you raise in your book are so, so, yes, it is a very specific story of a specific person in a specific place and a specific country, but it's also what minorities all over the world are struggling with, regardless of what they are. And I really want to thank you, Nobio, first for writing the book. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Chuma, for all the hard work you brought, bringing in the history, weaving it so well, and, and helping us think about how our stories really do matter. And um, we are going to finish by putting up the trailer of your book so that those who haven't had a chance to get a sense of it will get a sense of it. But I want to thank you in the words of some of the participants. Florida Rugendo says, I love the description of the events in the story. It brings out the real feeling of the story as if one was physically present in the scene. And I absolutely agree with that. Lillian Olik um, says, this is such an impressive book, psychologically, culturally, and historically impressive. And she just loved the discussion. Uh, Jail Sishanya said it's very, very interesting. And I just want to thank every one of the participants who has joined us, uh, Dr. Novuyo Chuma for taking time. One last word, should we be looking out for a new book? Is it uh, such, a, <laughs> such a pleasure. Yes, um, in the next weeks, a uh, few weeks I'll be announcing, I'll be making an announcement. But yes, I've, I've finished a new book and yeah. Um, yeah, more on that. Thank you for, for asking that question. Well, all the best. We'll be looking out for that. And we really look forward. For those of us who haven't read the book, please get yourself a copy and read it. For those of you who have read it, read it again. I've read it for the third time. And each time I discovered new things. And now, thank you. We'll be joining you. Um, please join us again as we come to you with the African Book Talk series. Today, we've had such a pleasure to talk to Dr. Shuma on her book, House of Stone. And we will be coming back to you again with another exciting book and a wonderful, amazing author in two weeks. And now the book trailer for House of Stone. Thank you, everybody.